All right, John chapter number 20 is where we're going to spend our time today. Uh, continuing our sermon from last week, what death could not kill. And I'm so excited because after our message, amen, we're going to get a chance to dedicate a baby. Praise God. Just as a reminder, amen, that life always goes on. You ought to tell your neighbor, life goes on, amen. Amen. It, it'll, it'll, life will outlast you, praise God. And uh, it is a great gift to be reminded of that. I find that uh, that is for sure one of the highlights of being a pastor is you get to dedicate and christen and lift up the little babies to God as an act of an offering to be reminded that we as a community welcome and love our children and our babies. Amen. And so uh, that'll be the capstone of our preaching and teaching time today. Uh, it, it goes without saying, or at least it should go without saying, that uh, resurrection is uh, not a singular event. It is an event that literally is based on our capacity to ascertain, to understand, to welcome God's resurrecting power into our lives. I was talking to a few folks uh, this week, and, you know, we were all, you know, just kind of continuing to bemoan the tragedies that happen uh, to us in our families, in our communities, in our country, and in our world. And in the course of the conversation, you know, I asked uh, one, one of our comrades, I said, uh, do you make time for resurrection in the midst of tragedy? Do you make time to imagine that God's power could be manifest while you and me and we are going through? Uh, that tragedies may be commonplace, but so is resurrection. The power of God to be unleashed in our circumstance is not a myth, it's not a fable, it's not some religious kind of uh, uh, opiate for the masses, as has been said in times past, but I believe that if you and me and we take a close look at the course of our lives, that God finds ways to bring us back alive from our most desperate and hopeless places. Some of us may not know it's God. We may think it's fate. You may think it's the strength of your own intellect or your own accomplishments, but I find that there are moments in our lives where we can be convinced that if it had not been for God who was on our side, so I got a witness in here that whatever you think you could not have made it through, thank God you're still here. Come on, pat yourself on the chest and say, I'm glad I'm still here. Amen. I'm, 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 I'm struggling still a little bit. I haven't made it all the way out. Mm -hmm. But I'm still here. Uh, I, I, I'm going I'm to I'm read this, this uh, excerpt from this first ancient sermon to start off our message because I want us to close our message reading these words as well. Um, this message uh, its a long message. I'm not going to preach the whole part of it. But this message uh, was one of the earliest written sermons during the Easter celebration of the of the early church. I think this was uh, literally preached around 140, 150 or so. So uh, it is the first one of the first or most ancient recorded excerpts of a minister offering uh, a reflection on Easter and on its impact for God's people. And so uh, I love to invoke these words as a prelude to our sermon today. Before or after we read this, we'll jump to the text. But this is what the words of the ancient sermon says. I did not create you to be held a prisoner in hell. Rise from the dead, for I am the life of the dead. Rise up, you work of my hands. You who were created in my image, rise and let us leave this place, for you are in me, and I am in you, and together we form only one person, and we cannot be separated. And the, the, the idea that resurrection is an invitation for you and I to rise 
from the dead. It is as early as the practice itself of those who were living in the immediate light of resurrection. John chapter number 20 then is our text for today that captures the immediate aftermath. If you recall last week, uh, we talked about how Jesus shows up in the dark uh, to, or there were individuals who showed up in the dark uh, at Jesus' tomb, disciples, Mary Magdalene uh, showing up early, uh, Peter and John showing up a little bit later, but still early enough. And then they, the scripture says, after they went to the tomb, they went back to their homes and continued to wrestle with what had happened. So John chapter number 20, I want you to imagine that you are one such disciple. I want you to imagine that you just came back from literally visiting an empty tomb, a tomb that is supposed to hold your spiritual leader, your revolutionary leader, the person that you think is going to usher in your greatest hopes and aspirations. You watched him killed on a Friday, Sunday morning. You show up and he's not there and you're seeing angels talking about he's risen from the dead and you looking inside a tomb has some, 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 some linen left behind, praise God, and you're trying to figure out, hey amen, what is going on? Their response after they saw or were told these miraculous things in verse number 19, when it was evening, John chapter 20, verse number 19, when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came through locked doors, presumably, stood among them and said, peace be with you. And after Jesus said this, Jesus showed them his hands and his side. Why? Because if Jesus was crucified, he had marks in his hand. The scripture says, the account says that he was pierced in his side by the Roman soldiers. Why? To expedite his death, to literally puncture his lungs and parts of his inner organs so they would... Uh, uh, bleed out faster so the weight of his body would then become an even more part of his torture as he died. Gruesome death, right? So Jesus is like, I got marks to show you what I've been through because you're going to recognize these marks. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when Jesus had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, somebody say, but Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the 12 was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told Thomas, we have seen the Lord. Thomas said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, unless I put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, Jesus' disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them and the doors were shut. And Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Thomas, then Jesus said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hand. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to Thomas, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now, I love verse 30. It's one of my favorite scriptures in the Gospels. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But what is written? These are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. 
Uh, we're going to talk for, you know, some time here the next few weeks about the process. What does it mean for you and I to lean into a process of resurrection? A process where we can come to believe. It is not always that you will just land with two feet on belief. <clears throat> Sometimes you're going to have to come to believe that God can resurrect us from dead places and spaces in our lives. Bow your heads with me and let's pray. God, we want to say thank you, Lord, for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest upon me and the hearers of this word. And we'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Amen. Somebody holler, no more locks. Amen. No more locks. It is always a powerful commentary, for me at least, that when Jesus rises from the dead and when his disciples experience resurrection, they see the miraculous, the, the literal highest miraculous act from Jesus. Now, I want you to be reminded, these disciples had watched Jesus do a lot of things that they could not explain. They watched Jesus walk on water. You don't see that every day. <laughs> they watched Jesus raise a dead man. No, it's not a common thing. Watch Jesus feed thousands of people with a couple loaves and some fishes. Stretching a lot, a lot of little food, you know, Jesus working on a budget. They watched Jesus heal and uh, the person who was blind. Now they can see. So they have a track record with Jesus. They have watched Jesus do things that perhaps no one else has done. And I think after some of these miracles, you know, the disciples probably were a bit befuddled. But they was like, you know, I'm going to ride out with this because, you know, this is something that we ain't seen before. But in the heart of many, many of the disciples, most of them were likely expecting a social and political revolution. Because they were so grounded and anchored in their experience of oppression and struggle in the empire of the Romans that they were likely uh, kind of thinking that when Jesus was talking about, I'm bringing in a new kingdom, I'm bringing in a new order, a new empire, they weren't necessarily thinking on the same lines as Jesus. And so you got to appreciate that all of these miracles, they thought perhaps were to convince the masses that Jesus was worth following to ride into Rome and buy some hocus pocus, buy some, you know, spiritual actions, do a coup d'etat. And they ended up watching their leader get killed. Jesus rising from the dead had to have been just as jarring as Jesus being killed. Have you ever had high hopes and then your hopes get dashed and then you show back up and it's like, wait a minute, maybe I didn't see what I just saw. Maybe my mind was playing tricks on me. Maybe my eyes deceived me. Whatever what. Whatever caused them to have some dissonance, it is clear that at the height of Jesus' miraculous work and power, Jesus being resurrected from the dead, they all uh, literally wrestling with uh, the, 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 the Roman Empire being, being willing to kill their political leader. Their response the evening of Jesus' resurrection was not to gather folks and run out into the streets and celebrate. Their response was to go home and lock themselves in a room. Amen. 
And I think that is probably a very resonant response for many of us. When we have encounters with God that kind of don't match, meet, or help us make sense of things, we are not always running out here to proclaim that I had an encounter. We're kind of running back to the place we were before and locking ourselves in whatever experience that we literally were just a few hours ago thankful God brought us out of. Hello, somebody. Isn't it interesting that we as human beings can hope for so much, but yet our expectations can be literally minimized because of one word, fear. We talked about this a little bit last week. What would our life look like if we were not so dominated by fear? Fear of someone else. Fear of yourself. Fear of failure. I even used to tell the young people, you seem to be afraid of success. <laughs> I can recall talking to some of the young folks when we used to work at B-Tech, and one of them was like, you know, McBride, this is too much pressure. You trying to get me to go to college, trying to get me to pass SAT? I wasn't trying to do that. I'm cool. <laughs> I don't want all these expectations. I just want to glide. I just want to slide. But when you start asking me to do all this stuff, it creates pressure, and I don't want to fail. I told the young boy, young fella, I said, no, it's not that you don't want to fail. You are afraid to succeed. And one of our greatest challenges when we are in relationship with the almighty God, dealing with life that has death so ubiquitously around us, is that fear can literally suck out our capacity to dare to succeed. Fear can paralyze us. Fear can literally uh, shrink the part of your mind and your spirit that is meant to fly and roam without any constriction. I mean, it is not a mistake that the angel said to Mary and the disciples at the tomb, fear not. It is not a mistake or a coincidence that Jesus' response to these individuals when he first meet them is do not fear. Could it be that God's voice to you in this room, to you online, is that he wants to take away your fear. Fear. Now, fear is not always a bad thing. Fear is useful in that it can remind you that you are human that you have limitations, that you are vulnerable, that you are not an inanimate object, that you have feelings. Fear is a useful tool because it can help you have some deterrence. It will help you not be too risky with that which is of ultimate importance to you. But when fear is used not as a protection, but as a barrier. Fear becomes the enemy of God's activity in your life. And there are a lot of factors in this world that want to put fear in you and I. There are a lot of people who are okay having you fearful, having you move, dominated by the irrational presence of fear. Why? Because fear will paralyze us. Fear will cause us to surrender things that we deem important if we weren't so fearful. Fear is a tactic that is used by our state, this empire we live in called the United States of America. Fear of the other. Fear of dark-skinned, melanated people. 
fear of Muslims and foreigners, quote unquote, immigrants, fear of queer and trans folk, fear of poor folk, fear of drug addicts, and fear of the incarcerated folk. And if you aren't one of these folk who has a lot of proximity to certain kind of people, you will let this country make you fear everybody except for yourself until you fall into that category. And listen, when you fall into a category that someone has taught you to fear, you will then not fear yourself, you will hate yourself. Hello, somebody. God never wants you to hate yourself. You ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell him, God ain't asking you to hate yourself, amen? There's nothing about you that you should feel like God wants me to be so hateful and, oh, God, why, is, why am I like this? Why is my situation like this? No, what God wants to do is give you resurrection. Fear robs you of space for God to resurrect you. Fear makes you have irrational feelings and responses to things that could be the answer to your prayer. I wish I could talk to somebody in here. When, when you look at this text now, the process of them coming to believe what they saw with their eyes required them to shed their fear. Now, what happened when they didn't shed their fear? The first thing they did uh, was that they locked themselves up. What does fear do? It causes you to get locked up. The scripture says that the doors of the house were locked. Now, I've got to tell you that <laughs> if I just saw someone who died on Friday and they alive on Sunday, it, 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 I have a little shaky leg, a little, little weak knees. <laughs> Somebody say, man, we'll be like, oh, man, you know, I wouldn't appropriate that to me. I would probably be like, oh, snap. The, 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 the Roman Empire thought they killed this man, and he's not, what, he gonna, they gonna come for me. We couldn't kill Jesus, so we gonna kill you, Peter. See if you can do that trick. <laughs> but the problem with Peter is Peter seemed to forget that he ain't Jesus. They ain't killing Peter, why? Because Peter ain't raising no dead folk just yet. Peter ain't walking on water. Matter of fact, Peter was kind of a hater. Man, Peter's one of these people, why are you, why are you with this Samaritan woman, Jesus? Why are you talking, why, why, why are we over here in this town, Jesus? Peter was kind of slow to catch up with Jesus' mission. Jesus was willing or was, was uh, uh, important enough to be killed by the empire because Jesus was disrupting the status quo. And Jesus' death was turned into a redemptive act of salvation for all humanity. And his resurrection was a down payment for all of us to experience the same resurrection. They could not fully understand it and their lack of understanding gave way to fear, which then caused them to lock themselves in a room. I wonder if you have locked yourself in rooms and places and thoughts and ideas and practices because you have not yet fully understood that the power of God is greater than the power of the forces that cause you to fear. I mean, if we go back to, 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 the, to the, the sermon that we read uh, at the beginning, uh, it, it is simple. It says that I did not create you to be held a prisoner in hell. 
If you are locked in a room of fear, you are living in an open air prison. And God does not want you locked up in an open air prison of fear. God wants you to walk with boldness that God, you are with me. I know life is precarious and I know there are challenges. I know my relationships, my job, my career, my vocation, my health is not always what I want it to be. But God, I know that resurrection power is at work in me and us. So I'm not going to lock myself in a room because everything's not going the way I think it should go. But I'm going to lean in to the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Can literally raise me from my space of depression, my space of anxiety, my space of fear. I will not fear. And I want you to understand, child of God, that as Mandela says, I've learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but triumph over it. Fear will not leave you. You must learn to overcome it. How many know that the things that are present in your life will rarely leave your life? Grief won't leave. You must learn to, with time, Overcome it. It is kind of like, you know, I'm not an animal lover. Sorry, I, there's a lot of them in their church, I know. Uh huh. But, you know, it is important, at least from someone who's not an animal lover, when you're out to, you know, you have these wonderful pets, particularly, you know, Rottweilers that have just fluids dripping from their mouth as they're walking down the street bothering nobody. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Sometimes you have to put the Rottweiler on a leash. Somebody say amen. You ain't got to disappear the Rottweiler. I'm not saying the Rottweiler can't exist. You just got to have a leash for it. So it can, you know, be under the control of hopefully someone with the full capacity of their mind. Well, that's what your fear needs to be seen as in your life. Put your fear on a leash. I'm not gonna let my fear just run rampant out here. Let my fear be, be out here running ahead of me and I can't pull it in. I love these dog owners when they dogs get too, you know, tails get to wag and they get too excited. Oh, well, come, no, no, come on back here. Man, cause the scary McBride, you know, he's uncomfortable. Wouldn't that be something if you saw your fear like that? Oh, the fear is this a, it's a, it's a good, it, it's a good defense mechanism, but this fear is becoming irrational. This fear is causing me to lock myself up in a room. I know gun violence is running rampant out here, but you know, I'm not gonna allow fear to cause me to give up all my human rights to police agencies that can't stop texting each other mean, racist, nasty messages to describe us. I'm, 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 I'm gonna give up all my rights to them? No, that's, that's an irrational fear. Fear is used in this country to cause you and I to literally have a smaller vision of community, of family. If Jesus has the power to resurrect himself, guess what that means? Jesus has the power to resurrect you. Resurrect us. I will not be locked up because of my fear. So here, here's a question I want you to think about. What fears have contributed to your own lockup? Are there experiences that have locked the doors of your heart? Are there fears that have locked the door of your mind and your soul? How will you get free from being locked up? 
the process of resurrection requires that you eschew the fear that causes you to be locked up. Somebody holler, I will not be locked up. The second thing that the scriptures give to us is they were locked up, but they were also locked in. When you get locked up, guess what? That means you get locked in. You build boundaries for yourself. You can't move freely. You lock yourself into limitations. You lock yourself into spaces that are not big enough to hold you. I am someone who believes powerfully in the cultural, social uh, 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 identities that help us make meaning of our lives. But I want you to know that those identities can also lock you in and rob you of everything that God intends you to be. You are more than social descriptions of your life. You are created in the image of God. Fearfully and wonderfully made. When you lock yourself in and only have groups that look like you, think like you, sound like you, you are robbing yourself of the beauty of all creation. I, my, my power, some of my most powerful experiences in ministry have been working with young people. So I always got the good young people stories. Remember, we wanted to take the young people to the snow. One of the young people told me, I'm, where's that at? So it's up in Lake Tahoe. Well, where's that at? It's like four hours away. No, I, I, don't, I don't leave Sacramento Street here in Berkeley. <laughs> I said, what? I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't do that, McBride. So I don't know what's up there. So I know, bro, we all going to get on the bus. <laughs> we going to ride literally together. No, I'm not doing that. I don't. I, I said, have you ever been to Pier 39? He said, where's that at? I said, San Francisco. No, I'm telling you, I, I don't leave Sacramento Street. That's, if you ain't live in Berkeley, that's a long street right here in Berkeley. Locked in. That's the why, because, you know, somebody would try to hurt me if I, you know, this, this is my comfort zone. How many of us have comfort zones like that? I don't, I don't go, no, I'm not going over there. Because, you know, there's, there's some things over there that, you know, I can't control. There's some people over there. There's some circumstances over there. Lock yourself in. Why were they locking themselves in here? Because they were afraid of the religious leaders and the empire that killed Jesus. Fear makes you literally shrink the infinity, the infinite possibility into that which you can only see with your eyes. But listen, faith, biblical definition, is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. How can you access everything God has for you and your family, your purpose and your vocation, if you can see it all with your eyes? Hello, somebody. I mean, I have pretty good vision, but I can't see everything that God is up to at one time. <laughs> Matter, I don't want to see everything that God is up to at one time. I want God to surprise me. I want God to just drop something and be like, what you got? Mm -mm -mm. I mean, you know, you, you, uh, 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 Sister Florence, Mother Florence is getting ready to launch the, the, the Season Saints ministry. And if you hang around some Season Saints, they always got them sounds. Mm, mm, mm. It's just, oh, what? Oh, ah, yeah, yeah. You want to know what that, that's coming from? God surprising them through the course of their life. God will do some stuff in your life and you won't even have words for it. Mm, mm, mm. 
Baby, God, mm, mm, can't he finish it? You know, mm, 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 God, mm, mm. That comes from God dropping things in your life that you could not see. When you lock yourself in to only what you can see and control, you rob yourself, your family, your children, your progeny, your coworkers, your students, you rob them from the infinite possibilities of the God who is working to resurrect us. God did not create you to be a prisoner in hell. God wants you to be free. And the people that make you want to stay only on Sacramento Boulevard because they've hurt you and they've harmed you, God wants you to be free from them too. Remember, see, now, this is one of the most important teachings of Jesus. We've not learned this as a country. We've not learned this as a people. When we feel threatened by people who have harmed us, we want to eliminate them. That's what we're taught. Eliminate the threat. Isn't that what we taught? Eliminate it. I'm going to get you before you get me. But I want to suggest to you that the work of Jesus in the world is to remove violence from the heart of the follower of Jesus. Can you imagine that the most appropriate response to those who have harmed you is to put them on a figurative, not a real one, leash. <laughs> Maybe a better word, to create healthy boundaries. I ain't gotta eliminate you, I'm just gonna have some boundaries. You're not gonna get close enough to hurt me. I'm not gonna lock myself in because some hurt is out there. I'm going to learn how to have boundaries. So your recklessness does not penetrate the most precious part of me. Fear will have you wanting to eliminate harm when faith will invite you to create boundaries and trust that God will not only take good care of us, but God will heal whatever harm comes our way. God will resurrect it. The healing. Second question, what has caused you harm? Where are you hiding? What practices must you engage to move past these harmful people and the anger, fear, and pain that causes irrational locks to be placed on the doors of your heart. Last thing I'll say, and then we'll create a few moments for some prayer. Fear will have you locked up. It'll have you locked in. But fear will also cause you to lock out. The gifts that God is trying to introduce into your life. Jesus... <laughs> Sorry, I'd be laughing because, you know, it'd be coming to me in waves. Jesus just been resurrected. His disciples have locked themselves in the room. If Jesus is resurrected and Jesus is out moving freely and his disciples have locked themselves in the room, locking themselves in the room means that Jesus is what? Locked out of their life. The only gift of Jesus, power, listen to this, is that Jesus knows how to walk through locked doors. You lock yourself up, you be like, oh, that's cool. I, I'm, I'm used to walking through locked doors. <laughs> only Jesus can do it now. 
The rest of us, I'm not walking through no locked door. Especially, you know, I read the news last night, some, some brother went to pick up his little brother or sister and went to the wrong house and was knocking on the door. Someone opened the door and shot and killed. It was so tragic. I don't walk through locked doors because I don't know what's on the other side of that door. Especially with all this melanin in my skin, you know. I be walk to a locked door, ask for a cup of sugar, and they may think I'm trying to rob them. So I stay away. If the door is locked, I try one time. It's locked, I step away and be like, okay, well, pull out my phone. <laughs> is, anyone, is anyone in here that know? Am I in the right place? That is the limitation of my humanity. How many know if you run into a locked door, you probably not going to kick that door down? At least I hope you're not. But guess what? Jesus knows how to walk through locked doors. Jesus knows how to walk through locked minds. Jesus knows how to walk through locked hearts, locked souls. They lock themselves up. Jesus knows how to walk through the closed and shut doors of our lives. Where do you need? That's what I'm end on. The process of your resurrection, of our resurrection, is Jesus knows how to walk through locked places. Let's stand to our feet then. I will not fear. Grab the hand of someone next to you or touch their shoulder or whatever feels most comfortable. Feel free to do it across the aisle. Let's just leave no one untouched. God, I pray for the person that I'm touching, that I'm proximal to. I pray, God, that on a day where we are committing to the process of resurrection, that we will look fear in the eye and say that it will not cause us to be locked up, locked in, or locked out. But, God, we will lean into the faith that is the elixir to fear. It is the medicine that puts fear on the leash it deserves to be on. It is the power that causes us to believe that resurrection is within our reach, is at work within us. We may not always see it, we may not always be able to describe it, but we can have confidence that resurrection is here and it's here working in the lives of the loved ones who I'm touching. So give strength to them, squeeze their hand gently. I pray strength into their hands and their feet and their body and their mind, their soul and their spirit. Whatever the enemy is trying to do in their life that is unleashing death and despair and depression and confusion, bondage, limitation, I pray God that fear would be cast out of them and faith and hope and possibilities yes, yes, yes. will break forth within them. Do it today, God, because you've done it time and time again. May we be people not driven by fear, but people ignited by resurrection. Now lift those hands right where you're standing. It's me, oh Lord, and I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my mother, it is not my father, my sister, or my brother. But it's me, oh Lord, and I need you. Somebody say, I need you, Lord. I need you, God, to bring resurrection near to my heart. I need you to resurrect my relationships, Lord God. Resurrect my children. Resurrect my friends. Resurrect my coworkers. Resurrect my neighborhood, my home, my city, this country, this world. May resurrection break forth, Lord God, so we can walk in the victory that reminds us that death does not have the final say. Do it in the name of Jesus. We receive it in the name of Jesus. We declare it in the name of Jesus. And so it is done. If you believe it, somebody holler, it is done. Say it again, it is done. Give somebody a great big hug or a high five and tell them no more locks. No more fear. It is done. 
in your life. Hallelujah.